My name is Christian Hano. I'm a um, research group leader at uh, CSRO. CSRO, the uh, national um, research organization here in Australia. And it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the two last speakers for, for today, Lana Borukova and Stephen Bourne. Um, Svetlana is working currently at Innocent BV and uh, um, over the last few years, I think Innocent has been really at the forefront of developing uh, new technologies for new solutions also for, for flow chemistry, using obviously flow chemistry as a, as a method. Um, but also combining that with many other new emerging uh, technologies, including smart catalysis and, and also additive manufacturing. And just tying in with uh, some of the comments that Volker had made uh, yesterday and, and Caroline has made today, um, flow chemistry was recently, uh, last week, named as one of the priority areas uh, within um, Australia. Uh, but one of the other priority areas that were also named was additive manufacturing, sp specifically 3D printing. So it's, it's fantastic to see that you are combining the two uh, with the work that you're doing at, uh, at Innocin. Um, just a few words on Svetlana herself as well. So Svetlana you started her um, scientific career at Eindhoven University, um, where she's done both the master degree and the PhD degree uh, under the supervision of none other than uh, Volker Hessel himself. So uh, both of you go way back for many years already. And then uh, you also spent some time um, in at the TU Darmstadt at Professor Bush and the high pressure labs uh, there, which is again combining another fantastic and very unique um, capability uh, and uh, uh, technology that is of high value for very specialized materials. After Eindhoven, um, Svetlana then joined um, Janssen Pharmaceuticals as a process engineer in API small molecule development, and uh, most recently joined uh, Innocin uh, BV. And now with that, I'll hand over to you, Svetlana, and uh, um, for your talk on scale up of cryogenic chemistry to pilot plant scale using 3D printed reactors. Floor is yours, Svetlana. Thank you so much. And thank you for a beautiful present uh, introduction. Let me just see um, if the sharing of the screen is working. Is everything, do you see my screen? I cannot hear Coming you anymore. Beauty flow. Well, good. All good, Svetlana, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. Then uh, you actually saved some uh, time for me, indeed. Um, so yeah, I, I do work as a process engineer and competence manager for Innocent. And today it's my great pleasure to talk here. Um, actually, IMAT was my first ever conference to attend to um, during my master's. Um, and there I met uh, big stars of, of flow chemistry such as Klaus Janssen and Oliver Kappe. Um, that was quite an impressive um, period. So it's quite sad that we're in the, we're a virtual platform right now, but I hope next year it will all be good and we'll meet face to face. And just to bridge that, it's nice that we have this event and I would like to talk about scale up of cryogenic chemistry to pilot plant scale using 3D printed reactors. Uh, but first I would like to introduce Innocent as a company. Uh, so we're quite small organization. Uh, we're a contract research and development organization located in the Netherlands, um, in the sort of <laughs> appendix of the Netherlands uh, in the province of Limburg in the city called Flame. Uh, we have more than 25 years of experience since the company used to be an R&D group uh, in DSM. And in total, we have 55 uh, passionate scientists who apply uh, multiple tools like uh, biogatalysis, chemogatalysis, flow chemistry, photochemistry, um, and also crystallization to new or existing processes to deliver um, robust, safe, and uh, profitable solutions. So today's message that I would like to share is that in the past years, we've had multiple development requests, including cryogenic chemistry. And in all cases, they had to be done really fast. So uh, we had to de demonstrate the proof of concept, feasibility, and quickly jump onto the production scale and actually uh, demonstrate uh, the process, but also have uh, uh, ready to operate equipment um, as a sketch. So that's in a couple of years ago, that was still a gap. Uh, and mainly there was uh, um, not that many, let's say, uh, 
uh, reactors available on large scale, as well as the production units themselves. So over the past years, we've worked on, on, this, uh, on these gaps, and uh, by now we have addressed this. And today I will show how we now move uh, from feasibility to pilot, pilot, pilot plan scale sorry, in a fast track. So knowing that <laughs> EMIT has quite an um, yeah, audience that is aware of flow chemistry benefits, I purposefully uh, left out all the benefits of, of flow chemistry. However, I do want to mention that we see uh, value brought, brought by flow technology in four main dimensions. One of them is reaction. So because you can uh, screen the parameter space quite fast and also optimize the reactions uh, quite fast. And those reactions don't have to be later implemented in flow. They can also be in batch. But just this uh, doing the experiment so fast and getting so much data um, uh, there, flow technology helps a lot. And the second one is actually the reactor that you can uh, tailor to the reaction so that also you have a freedom in that thanks to 3D printing actually. Um, and that also then serves as a product and brought, uh, brings value to the clients or uh, us uh, while serving the clients. And later, of course, this flow technology uh, reactor is, is like a heart, but it cannot do it, the work by itself. So it has, uh, it needs lots of auxiliary equipment and that is easy actually to assemble together and then deliver as a, plug and play, let's say, a unit either to our pilot plant or to the side of the uh, client. So there we see four different dimensions where flow technology really brings the value in comparison to batch. So coming back to the focus of today is the organometallic chemistry. It's a chemistry that requires quite deep cooling um, and also is sensitive to uh, temperature fluctuations, uh, which lead to uh, robustness issues and also safety and also uh, losses in the yields. Yeah, so specifically, we will, I would like to take your attention to the organolithium chemistry. So here is the condensed scheme, we can say. So what happens is the ideal halide reacts with alkyl lithium to form a very uh, reactive aryl, uh, lithiated aryl here. And this transformation in itself is quite exothermic and fast and also subsequent reactions are very fast and exothermic. And at the end, you, you after, at the end of these two reactions, you form one carbon-carbon bond. So this is very, um, let's say, uh, useful transformation, uh, be it in agricultural uh, products, uh, pharmaceuticals, or yeah, fragrances. So anywhere it can be used. Um, again, as I said, typical characteristics of the reactions that in, Intermediates are unstable, and the reaction is exothermic and fast. So the challenges that come with that is that the, uh, this, under, this very reactive intermediate can degrade um, uh, over time. And that is actually um, affecting the, the yield. And also due to this high exothermicity, usually you have to slow down the reaction rate and therefore decrease the production rate, which could otherwise be achieved. And also due to this uh, low uh, temperatures, you also need a subsequent amount of energy to cool the reaction down, and that also brings costs up. Yeah. So let's now look at the at the workflow process. Let's say uh, that we go on uh, in every time we get a request to develop such a such a process. So first of all, we look at what kind of cooling capacity is required. So given the fact that uh, so it, even though in batch sometimes the required temperatures can be very low, minus eighty, let's say. We, you, you see that due to the good heat transfer and mass transfer in flow technology, you can actually get away uh, by working high temperatures without affecting chemistry. It's just because you, you, uh, there are no, almost no hot spots and you consume that uh, intermediate quite fast. Yeah, so we look at, at what kind of where, how exothermic is this reaction? Because also in, in, in organometallic reactions, also there is a spectrum of, um, of, of the reaction in terms of the heat and uh, reaction enthalpy. So once that is determined, we move to the mixing efficiency. The mixing efficiency is improving with the Reynolds number. So the higher is, the better is. However, due to the limited amount of material that we have, it's quite, uh, you either have to dilute a lot uh, or you have to uh, have very narrow channel, ch channels, which uh, are very prone to clogging and also end up in a, a quite high pressure drop. So that's why we usually, uh, we apply two methods and we determine what is the, temp the required 
time for the for the mixing and it, it has to be shorter than the reaction time and then we determine the reaction time and one uh, one that is set simply the multiplication of the required flow rate and the time gives the reactor volume which we then use to investigate reaction parameters uh, and once that is set we go into robustness study and here this is like um, observing a, a patient in a hospital so you you, you see what kind of uh, how, how its body, let's say, so how, how it operates um, when su sudden changes or spikes in, in some operating parameters take place. And with that information, so with the data that you collect there, uh, we can get, then do a first scale up to the zigzag lab reactors, they're 3D printed, um, and you again uh, go through the same cycle. So you again make a robustness study, you see what are the critical operating parameters there, and with that knowledge you can then move on to the design of the larger scale reactor. So let me just show you the example of how it looks like. So at first, as I said here, basically, it's very simple coiled reactor re reactors with uh, thermocouples included uh, in the T pieces. And all the data is stored in the lab manager. And there we investigate the required mixing, required temperatures, and yeah, required operating parameters. And here already, depending, of course, on the residence time, you can generate more than 100 grams per hour. And uh, over two steps, we usually see that the yield is more than 95%. So then we, as I said, we check the robustness and we go to the 3D printed zigzag reactors, as you can see behind uh, this, this arrow. And that is then uh, implemented into a larger cryostat and also the Russell study is performed. And at that point, again, depending on the resonance times, you can uh, perform uh, or you can produce more than 300 grams per hour of the material. That then brings, so the data that you acquire here brings you to the reactor design. And in the reactor design, the most important attribute when it comes to this exothermic reactions is the heat uh, removal. So what you have to, what we have to take into account is that the heat transfer rate has to be higher than the heat production rate. Um, and heat production rate depends on the uh, product of uh, reaction enthalpy and reaction rate. And uh, reaction enthalpy is set, so that's determined in actually in batch and RC, uh, RC1 experiments. And kinetic re reaction rate uh, is dependent on the concentrations. So in dilution, uh, you, can, you can affect it by dilution or by the temperature that you perform that reaction. Yeah, so the reaction temperature. So here you can see a graph where you can see that the, with the higher temperature, the conversion speeds up. So the reaction, reaction rate uh, is higher. And in that case, you'd have, for instance, at minus 20, the highest uh, uh, heat production rate. Yeah. And in order for this process, for instance, not to have any hot spots, you do need to remove that at the exactly same uh, rate. However, it's usually, so heat transfer rate is limited by the overall heat transfer coefficient, available area uh, in the reactor, and the temperature difference. So the transfer coefficient is, uh, I will quickly touch upon this, is dependent then on the fluid dynamics on both heat so transfers the fluid side and the process side, uh, as, and the area is dependent on the uh, just the channel dimensions. Yeah, so here again, you can see for the constant amount, constant heat transfer capabilities of reactor, um, the higher the temperature, so the faster the heat will be generated, the higher the heat spot uh, will be yeah, in temperature. And of course, sometimes your uh, VTA intermediate can tolerate this and sometimes not. So that's the, uh, and that's why for instance, even in flow sometimes you need to be working at the more dilute conditions or lower temperatures just to, uh, to not have that hot spot. Um, so quickly clarify what I meant for the heat transfer coefficient and the transfer area. So heat transfer coefficient is really this, um, basically the resistance, you can see it for heat transfer to take place from the hot reaction space to the cooling uh, media, yeah? So there you, see, you have a heat transfer at the resistance, let's say, uh, at the process side, then the conduction through the wall and the, to, to the cooling side. So, and you can maximize this heat transfer coefficient by maximizing the turbulence on both sides. And the conduction is uh, quite high and because the, it's, we mostly use stainless steel uh, reactors and the channel um, thickness is quite thin. So, and the other parameter is transfer area. And it's simply the so surface over volume ratio 
which for a circular uh, channel beca becomes simply four over diameter itself. So the uh, smaller the diameter is, the higher surface to volume ratio is. So that is just the fundamentals, let's say, and the way with an approach. So with the data we have at hand, we can uh, calculate what is the heat transfer required. So how, how wide can we then make the diameter? Uh, and then we can also see how long we can make it to tolerate the pressure drop that is actually growing with the length of the channel. Um, we then form it in the zigzag because in zigzags we see that uh, due to the secondary uh, flow patterns that are created at each bend, you actually improve the mixing uh, further without, um, actually, so it, it's interplay between the pressure drop um, and the uh, and the mixing efficiency. Yeah. So here, by making it zigzag, you slightly improve the performance of, of the reactor. Once this is set, we then uh, number them up. So, uh, and once that is done, uh, we also then parallelize uh, or make, make those uh, numbered up uh, units in parallel, so manifolding it. So there's two times branches um, in each reactor on a larger scale, and can be more depending on application. Um, but again, every time, uh, depending on the reaction chemistry, the diameters and everything can be changed. And it's great to have this kind of freedom uh, because that really gives um, great performance both for off the reactor for, for the specific, specific reaction. Uh, and also, I think, thanks to the 3D printed, uh, or the, let's say additive manufacturing, we can actually fabricate this um, reactor's design. So here you can see, uh, we design a reactor uh, and draw it in a CAD file, and then that just simply goes into the to our partners where it's uh, printed. And here you can see large scale reactors already um, that are used currently also in the in the skit that we have developed in a collaboration with the Dietrich um, process system. So here you can see a pre cooler, for instance, it's much smaller than the reactor. Yeah, so this is only 140 milliliters, so it's quite 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 tiny actually. Uh, but again, due to the residence times being so short, uh, the productivity is quite high. So here you can see then the, um, how it actually goes. So in the lab, uh, we have quite similar equipment. So it's gear, gear pumps, 3D printed spray coolers, and then the reactors. And when it goes to the largest sort of pilot plant scale, um, it's just a larger reactor that I showed right now. And the Dietrich system, for instance, helped us to pick the equipment and also integrate the whole system together. Yeah, but I, I, in terms of types of equipment, it's quite similar, but the dimensions change, of course. And when it comes to data generation and also understanding of the process in the lab, you can get uh, still quite limited data uh, because uh, of the intricate structures of the, of the uh, reactor. So you, there's limited space, let's say, where you can put sensors. Um, which does change when you go to larger scale. So here, there you can have multiple uh, data points uh, in, in one reactor, for instance, like you can see here. So here, for instance, you can see three ports where you can in put the thermocouples and which can show you how stable your, your system is, your processes, and also show you, yeah, in, in case something goes wrong. So that's, that's the beauty of uh, larger scale as kit. Let's say so, and here how it basically looks like. So, if you remember now, back the uh, the lab equipment. So this is just a bit more. It's my height, so 180 uh, meter height. And uh, here's a process control unit itself, and then here's uh, the reactor. So you can see how small the footprint is itself. So it's half meter here and one uh, meter uh, uh, wide. Yeah. So here's reaction one, reactor one for the litiation and then for the nuclear phase substitution, and behind is the reactor for the quench. So it's all contained in the, in the cooling box, which is a flush with nitrogen, so there is no condensation. At the bottom, you can see pumps and the valves and also the filters. So now let's look at the case studies that we are allowed to share. Um, so first of one is uh, just a classic, let's say. So we prepare the um, I will bromide, wait, sorry, <laughs> lithium I will, uh, from I bromide and alkyl lithium in the first step. And then it uh, line up with substitution with the ketone, we form tertiary alcohol. And the goal here was to produce one to five kilograms per hour of a product at five weight percent solution after quench. 
So, and here we wanted to see how it compares to typical batch process on the same scale. So let's say we have a, we have to deliver 50 kilograms of the material. Yeah. So first the reactor, let's say here's 800 uh, liters. It would be charged with little bromide in, in, a, in a solvent, something like THF. And then in, just because it has a, already a set and limited uh, transfer area, you have to match the uh, heat production rate, as I mentioned in the beginning. So therefore, you are using this dosing of uh, lithium, al alkyl lithium, um, as a so, yeah, as a way to control this heat generation, yeah, and that's why it takes a long time. So, it, it, for instance, at this time it will be six point, so almost seven hours, which means that litiated intermediates should also survive for that amount of time until it sees ketone. Yeah, and then ketone would also be again dosed over a long amount of time, and and then in, in total it would take sixteen point six hours, let's say, for this uh, just particular case, uh, which then so if you then Look at the productivity. So simply the amount of the material that you can make per time per that volume is four kilograms per cubic meter per hour. So um, again, quite large reactor needs quite deep cooling and only this productivity. And then when you look at the, for instance, what we now have standard in the graph flow kit, for instance, you see that you have um, three reactors. So not two, three. Uh, one for litiation, second one for nucleophilic substitution, and the third one for the quench. And here you see that the reactor volumes are quite short. Um, also, the exposure time, uh, which is the residence time, is also quite short. But it could be even shorter for other chemistries, which is this one was uh, in this uh, ranges. Um, however, this uh, skit, of course, it's a pilot plant, pilot plant uh, skit, and that's why the uh, throughput that you can do is also limited. Therefore, it would take you 16.6 hours, just in, as in previous case, to generate those 50 kilograms. Yeah, but it's not a limitation in itself because you can always change the reactors to a higher uh, volume, for instance, uh, without occupying any more space uh, as a footprint um, and reach high productivities. Yeah, so here, for instance, you um, just a comparison. So for the batch, for instance, you would have to use 800 liter reactor while in continuous you could get to 250 milliliter reactor. Yeah, and the footprint is quite small, as I said. So, uh, and also you can operate with this with heat transfer at the much higher, well, higher uh, temperatures. For some chemistries, chemistries, again, it can be even higher. However, there's always a problem of clogging in, uh, in the flow reactors. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone is aware of this. So in this particular case, we also observed it. And that was just because um, the ideal bromide had 320 ppm of water, and you can see how the lithium hydroxide deposition takes slowly on, and, it's, and this is the pressure um, uh, recorded in this first reactor with lithiation takes place. So knowing this, uh, we then came up with a clocking mitigation uh, procedure, let's say, or strategy, where we design a maximum possible channel diameter, which still keeps the uh, or provides a good heat transfer. Uh, we also pre-filter all kinds of uh, all the solutions just in case to uh, avoid any particles. Um, also we use pre-dried solvents, uh, usually the one that go uh, through the uh, mole sieve back bed. And we monitor fouling always by delta P and we always allow certain uh, delta P. Uh, and if that is then reached, we flush with water to dissolve the lithium hydroxide deposits. And once that's flushed, we also flush the system with dry solvent to um, go back and into production mode. So here you can see how the system purge takes place. So we purge first with THF to get rid of all the reactive intermediates or the regions. Later it goes uh, to be flushed with water uh, and later back with THF. So then you have uh, operational system within one hour. One of the questions that we get from clients always is um, the cleaning. It just because flow, okay, flow, flow, everything is quite small and there are lots of, it can be that there's lots of dead volumes in the system. So how do we clean the system? And here we um, picked riboflavin, which is, has a very low detection uh, limit. And here you can see uh, the time that we flush it with and also the concentration of the riboflavin. So you can see how it's sharply decreasing. It also shows a good uh, resistance time distribution in the, in the uh, I got in the skit. And then uh, on here, so this 
line is actually zoomed in from here on, you can see it's also decreasing. So in 45 minutes, you have uh, hardly anything detectable. And that's one point. And the other point was that we closed the reactors so filled up with water and recirculated for 24 hours just to see what it was left in the dead volumes of, the, of that the whole setup. And in the end of 24 hours or so, uh, we found 42 micrograms in the whole system. So a whole system, let's say it's three and a half liters. So 42 uh, micrograms in total. So with that, which means that the cleaning can be done quite well. Yes, so let's conclude uh, case study number one. Case study number two is um, another application also quite interesting actually. So again, we, we prepared a litiate uh, areal and then we uh, subjected to the reaction with a borate ester to make a boronic ester, which can later be used in the non-symmetric bioreal um, synthesis via Suzuki coupling. And here we had uh, productivity of two kilograms per hour, uh, slightly high concentrations of the regions, again, always limited by the temperature to operate at and their solubility, which is also related to temperature. And here are our two steps, we got more than 90% yield. And thanks to the mitigation uh, strategy that I showed previously, um, we had no significant pressure build up, um, but we did uh, choose to operate in four hour runs two times. Um, and in that, uh, we could produce 15 kilograms in total and hardly any lithium hydroxide deposition. Yeah. So coming to key takeaways again, uh, we identified two main gaps just based on the requests that come in, uh, in our lab, uh, such as large so large scale reactor and the production unit. And thanks to 3D, pr 3D printing, we can deliver a large scale reactor and thanks to ease of integration, we can also then deliver the production units. And now it's great to see how fast it can all happen, especially in this time that we're in. It's great to see that technology is as, that's out there is actually helping uh, to move um, in a very fast way from the problem to the solution. And uh, lithium hydroxide depositions were also solved uh, quite uh, easily. And yeah, this is, the solution is out there and thank you for, for your attention. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much Svetlana for a very interesting talk. Uh, fantastic to hear what you can achieve with your uh, new reactor systems. There are a range of um, questions coming through. I'm, I'm starting with a, um, a question or maybe a string of questions from, from Michael Young. He's interested in, in learning more about the maximum production rate of these reactor systems. Maybe you can comment on how much is, is uh, you, I mean, you've given examples in your talk, uh, extra case examples. Maybe you can comment on the on the uh, the general or the, the theoretical maximum that you can achieve with these reactors. And maybe also specifically going back to the examples that you, that you named. I think some of the uh, information was already on the slides, but can you maybe give um, some indication of what my, the maximum production rates are? Yes, I think it's, so. It's quite highly correlated to the concentrations that you're using and also the residence times. Yeah, if you if you're set with that volume. So, for instance, for this particular uh, system that we have now, um, which has 140 milliliter one reactor, 110 the other, we I think the maximum is five kilograms per hour. However, if you do need higher productivity, uh, it, it's all possible thanks to again 3D printing. So you could you could after designing a larger scale reactor and printing it, you could install it. Uh, almost in the same footprint and generate more. I hope that answered. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, thank you. Um, Giancarlo is asking, uh, first of all, he's congratulating on your talk, on a, on a very inspiring talk, uh, and, and I would agree with him. Um, he's asking how smooth the 3D printed uh, stainless steel channels are, and um, is there any roughne roughness that can increase the chances of precipitation or, or I guess, coating along the lines of the wall, leading further yes. down the track to blockaging, obviously. Yes, Can you yes, comment yes. on that? Yes, definitely. So it is, it is rough uh, because basically you, you, you melt the powder. Yeah, it's, it, it's stacked powder together and um, it, it is rough. Um, and it's very different from, for instance, from the normal stainless steel tubing that you're using. And it can be that if, if you are at the saturation limit, it can be that the, once there, the particle stops, that will be the, the creation of the, or the start of the, of the nucleation, let's say, and the crystal formation. 
it would not be a cause. I don't think it would be a cause. If it cause, it would form anyways uh, in any reactor. Um, but yeah, if if it's prone to clogging as in the react just in the system itself, it will clog in the reactor in our three D print reactor as well. And and I might I might just add. I assume that you're using SLM as the printing technique, not electron beam printing. Is that correct? Just melt, Which, yeah, yeah. Laser like, melting. Like, laser melting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah which has a different roughness than an electron beam. So that, that again, is, is, is another variability. Um, we maybe have time for two more. I, I see there's a lot of questions coming through online. We maybe have time for two more. So I, I'll hand the next question over to you, Svetlana, from Dipali Aurora. She's asking, she again congratulates you on the talk. And then she's asking uh, if you could please comment on the product quality that you obtained from those flow reactors, especially compared yeah. to batch. That's really great. Uh, so what you see is that um, it, it simply doesn't have any time. So reactive intermediate have no time to do anything else uh, than react in the way you want it. So you have very high control over the what's actually happening in the reactor. So in that sense, the impurity profile improves every time. So in 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 all, in all cases I've seen so far, when we go to back from batch to flow, it it improves. So the the yields improve and the impurity profile improves. Fantastic. And uh, there's maybe one last question from Bert. He actually asked two, so um, I'm taking the liberty of, of picking, picking one out of those two. Um, did you ever had the design, uh, did you ever have to design a reactor for flash chemistry? So really, really small um, timescales, milliseconds, residence times, plus yeah. the potential quench at the end. Yeah, 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 we, we, yeah, we did. Um, uh, especially those reactions where you, it, it leads to explosions, for instance. So it's, it's not, not really this application, so it's not cryogenic for, for uh, but well, it is cryogenic, but it's much faster indeed than like flash chemistry. Yeah, we did have to re redesign it uh, just because that uh, at first we thought we'd get away with a higher diameter, but that was not the case. So then the small diameter and manifolding helped there to get a better performance. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much again, Svetlana, for a very interesting talk.